Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the RTC meeting for Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. I'm Jeff Baker, the chair, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. The first order of business is to see if there's any public comment. Since we're virtual this morning, Cam, is there anyone that has indicated they would like to speak to us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give it a moment, but... No, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is a review of the September 17th, 2024 RTC meeting summary. I'm assuming everyone has had a chance to review those, and I'm going to ask if there are any corrections or changes that are being requested by our members. You can go ahead and raise your hand virtually or turn on your camera and raise your hand. I can see you and uh, we'll make any changes that are requested. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Cam. Same, uh, no hands raised uh, from my perspective either. Great. So for that item, we'll go ahead and call those uh, that meeting summary um, accepted as presented. All right, we've got some great items on our agenda this morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to this next one, the Dr. Cog Crash Data Dashboard Demonstration. And we've got Brian Schultz here. He's a Senior Geographic Information System Specialist. Um, go ahead and kick it off to you, Byron. Excellent, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me just see here, let me share my screen. Okay, so. Getting everything set up here. Okay. All right. So um, you should be able to see my screen here, and 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 thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, my name is, is Byron Schultz, senior GS uh, specialist at Dr. Cog, and we wanted to present today um, on a tool that we've created that we we hope will be useful for our member governments and perhaps some of you on this in this committee as well. So. I'll jump in here um, and give some background. And just before I do this, this tool, you'll see there's a lot of data. It all has to do with crash. Um, and just wanted to mention and verbalize each point re does reflect a, a human life impacted by a crash. Um, and I think it's important to just acknowledge that before I kind of get into the technical data side of, of this topic. So um, so some background about, about this. Uh, we had some motivations for creating a regional crash data dashboard. Um, one of them was there was a need that we had heard for regional tools and prepackaged analysis um, around crash data, uh, that there's a continued safety crisis in the region and that more tools to help address it uh, were needed. And then at the same time, we at Dr. Cog felt that our capacity to deal with and understand the data was growing. Um, and this was an opportune time to create this, this product. And some objectives of this dashboard were to provide that easy access into the, the complex crash data. And I should mention, this is a public, publicly available tool, as I'll, as I'll show you. Um, provide a central location for the, the regional crash statistics that so many people might want or need, and then spur more action to achieve regional vision zero. So, um, the data source for this is, is crash data collected by law enforcement um, at the, either the scene of the crash or counter reports. Um, that data that law enforcement collect is transmitted to multiple places before it gets to us. So that's the Colorado Department of Revenue and the Department of Transportation where there's some processing and cleaning of the data. Um, and then we get that data and do further cleaning and processing. Um, and this, this data that CDOT provides is the basis for, for our product, but also a standard for, for use for many local governments, organizations. And the data in this dashboard right now is a rolling five-year window, um, 2018 to 2022, and we'll update that um, annually. So it'll be 2019 to 2023 next. Um, and this is the extent of the, um, the crash data, just to give you an idea of where you will find, find data in the dashboard and where you will not. Um, and just to mention, when we get the data here from CDOT, um, we do some quality control and processing of that data. 
we geolocate geolocate records that are not on the CDOT road network. And so that's just a fancy term for um, figuring out where to put the actual point on the map if there is no point um, given to us. We also clean up address fields because those are very important um, for locating the crash correctly. And then new in 2022, we're actually snapping the vast majority of crashes to the actual road network, um, the road data that, that we have um, those lines, we're snapping into those. Um, and then we do a manual check for any crash that involves a fatality serious injury or a non-motorist. Um, we look at those individually one by one and move them to the right spot if they are not at the right spot. Because there can be, um, there can be errors with the data in that chain of events from law enforcement all the way to us. Uh, we also did some stakeholder engagement. Um, to understand how to design this and then how to tweak it once it was designed as a draft. So we did some internal discussion in the winter first to just define what our objectives and audience were for this dashboard. And we did some software and data assessments. Um, and then we took that initial thought work to guide what questions we had for our stakeholders. Uh, we did in the spring, we started that engagement um, Internally here at Dr. Cog, we engage different teams um, that have a use for this dashboard or a use for crash analysis. Um, and those are listed there. Transportation um, and planning was a big one. Um, and then externally, we engage two groups explicitly, um, the Regional Vision Zero Working Group and the Crash Data Consortium, and ask them how they would use a dashboard and, and what purpose they might have, what questions they would want to answer. In the summer, um, we began translating what we heard into technical features of the dashboard, just kind of crosswalking it from planning needs to GIS uh, technical jargon. <laughs> and we built the first draft um, off, of the, off of that input. And then we sent that draft out for input on an actual tangible product. Um, and we launched the final draft uh, in September, September 9th, I believe. So this is a summary of what we heard during the, the stakeholder engagement. Uh, internally, staff wanted to be able to filter to a custom location, like a certain corridor um, was important. Identifying top intersections, understanding treads, trends in crash type and severity, and trends in bike and pedestrian crashes um, as well. And then externally, we heard we did hear some of those same themes there, but some of the new ones and some of the big ones were ensuring accuracy of the data, which kind of just going back to that point, it, there was there can be lots of errors when it comes from CDOT. We do our best to, to render that data as accurate as possible. Um, also, the um, desire to quickly identify hotspots, um, either at a regional level or within a municipality, compare crash types and trends in different parts of the region was something we heard and analyzing trends over time and assessing countermeasure efficacy before and after um, kinds of analyses. And so we built um, some of these key features into the dashboard and I'll show these um, shortly here. But one big thing is being able to filter the, the crash data by different attributes. Um, so you can look at a certain date range, your own municipality only or county, um, modes of travel, severity and, and the type of crash. And then we have themed tabs, which I'll show you just that you can drill down into the more specific topics if you so wish as well. So with that, I'll, I'll go into a um, quick dashboard demo. Um, and yeah, just I have this disclaimer again about the, the data points. So let me grab this here. So here we go. So this is um, the welcome screen for the dashboard. And we'll just close that and enter the dashboard. So. This is it. This um, I'll send the link in the chat as well, and it's in your packet. But it starts with a map of the region and a hotspot layer of where the most crashes are occurring. So you can just see these different on um, this grid here, and those darker colors are places where there are more crashes, and lighter colors are fewer. And there's places with no no crashes; they don't have a, a grid cell at all. So that's just going to give you an e easier way to kind of find those hotspots. And then you can go further in and get to the actual points and a more localized hotspot layer. Um, I'm going to zoom in further so we have just the points. So here's actual indi individual crashes 
um, that you can see and they're symbolized by the different um, modes involved and the severity. And so fatalities have that red color and serious injuries, the orange color. Uh, and then you have uh, icons for if it was a pedestrian or a bicyclist involved as well. So you have that ability. You can then click on any of these points and get some uh, quick information with a pop-up window here about um, when it happened, who was involved, uh, different conditions, and yeah, some, some other information about uh, the context and contributing factors, driver actions. So, okay, so that's the map. Then the next, the next piece here is there's a lot more going on, as you can see on the left here, we have a list of different selectors, and these are all ways you can filter the data. So you can see the title of these, and, and I think most are self-explanatory, but for example, we might be interested in here mode of travel to look at only bicycle related crashes. And then you can filter the, the map. So now the map only shows those. And then you also have on the side, um, these numbers will update um, total crashes, fatalities, serious injuries, and also your top intersections. Right now, this is region wide. But what you can also do is you can remove any of these filters at the same time. You can also filter by area. So you can use this tool on the top left. Um, and then you can go in here and maybe you're interested in this corridor of, of 10th Avenue. This is right where I live, so I've done this before. Um, but you can select those crashes specifically, and then it gives you um, your top intersection, the number of crashes, all of those, all those stats will update based on that. So two ways to filter attributes or by location like that. You could also filter to any of these intersections by clicking on um, the bar for that intersection. So let's just go back and quickly do um, the bicycle filter again and just want to show you the tabs. So right now, um, you've seen these statistics on the right, but there's also a when tab, which tells you about time of day, month, hour of day, day of week, when these crashes are occurring, um, a Y tab, which gets into, yeah, some of the conditions um, and, and this location information about the, the road description. The how tab here gets into the crash types and then this information about what driver action um, was associated how the vehicle was moving and the contributing factors um, in terms of officer opinion. And the who tab will get into, um, yeah, who was involved, some of the demographic information. Um, and this one, vulnerable road users, was something we built separate uh, based on the input. People really want to know um, for those pedestrians, scooters, um, bicyclist crashes, how, how those are looking in terms of um, where uh, the conditions and, and equity as well. So I'll reset, take bicycle off, and this is all VRU crashes for the region right now. So the last thing I'll just show you is this about tab. Um, there's a lot of information on this tab, which will uh, tell you about how to use the dashboard and, and more information on the data you're seeing and the defining that data and how we, um, how we are presenting the data in the dashboard. So that's another good resource. Um, so let's see, let me turn back to my slideshow and just close out here with um, the lessons learned. Um, we learned that it was best to engage with stakeholders early in the process. So to do it before we even built a draft was important um, so that people didn't feel that we had already basically finished the project, that their voice wasn't important, but to do it early. Um, oh, thank you, Cam. Uh, present review. Um, let me get out of the presenter view quickly here. <laughs> Beginning from the current slide. Um, let's see. Let's see here. Display settings. Yeah, see, I apologize. I don't know how, how we get out of the presenter view here. Um, let me try sharing my screen differently. Yeah, thank you. Let me try sharing. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, this one, okay, let's try sharing that. Okay. Yeah. Is that any better or is that still on presenter view? Yeah, it looks good, Byron. Uh, so all you have to do is you, if you look at the bottom, you see where it says like notes on the right side, just move mm -hmm. 
yeah, move over to the right and you see the little icon that says, yeah, so notes and then look to the right and you should mm -hmm. be able to present the uh, the full screen. Let's see here, no notes. Um, let's see, all I have is no notes here, I'm sorry. Let's see, hide. You're, you're fine, Byron, just proceed. Okay, all right, thank you, yeah, sorry about that. Um, hopefully it's been large enough to see, so. Okay, yeah, I'll just finish out here very quickly then. Um, so data, data cleaning was the most time intensive task that we had. Um, moving those points manually takes a lot of time um, and lots of adjustment um, as we found errors exposed in the data. Uh, and some decisions have no right or wrong answer. So we decided to opt to include a lot of functionality and the dashboard is a little bit slower, but if we had included fewer features, the dashboard could operate quicker, um, things of that nature. Exposing on a data on this scale highlights errors and inconsistencies with the data that comes from CETA that is processed by us, all those things. Um, so addressing those took time, was iterative. And then being aware of public perceptions about the subject matter, it's a sensitive topic and we just wanna be um, cognizant, cognizant of that. So the next steps, um, upcoming promotion with some social media campaigns. Um, we're also gonna create a video tutorial um, that explains how to use it and does some of that demonstration for people, update the data annually, and we will um, update the design and functionality as we receive additional feedback. So on that note, um, if there's time, I can take questions, but if you also want to reach out or if you have any issues with the dashboard, this email is included on the About tab of the dashboard. You can also email me um, with any, any questions or comments. So um, with that, I will Stop my share and take questions if there's any time. Thank you, Byron. Um, this is this is interesting. I have one question, and then I'll ask if there are any others. Who do you anticipate will be the primary users of of mm -hmm. the dashboard? Yeah, great question. Um, we hope that uh, planners at local governments who deal with with safety would would find it useful. I think that we we envision. We envisioned it being used at kind of like a high level um, in the process of maybe identifying priority locations or priority trends and crashes. But we do understand that oftentimes to really create um, a plan, people will, will dig deeper into the data or use a consultant or get a crash report. And the dashboard may not be able to serve at that level. But yeah, hopefully planners and safety professionals at our local governments are kind of the primary and then also internal staff here at Dr. Koch. And, and people that are attending this meeting, RTC, I can see um, us using it as well. I, mm -hmm. I'm uh, ready to start diving in and, and looking around at things. I just think it's fascinating, the things that we can do. Other questions or comments from any of our members this morning, you can either raise your hand virtually or you can, up oh, there they come. Uh, Commissioner Adams? Uh, yes, first of all, thank you for that. Uh... Report, I appreciate it. Earlier in your presentation, you made a comment about the need to verify data that you received from CDI. And so I'm just curious as to how much cleansing or inaccuracies you, you found or felt there might be within the CDI data, because if other if other areas in our state are using our CDOT information, I'd like to make sure that we get it as clean as we can. So any feedback on what you saw or what you are aware of with the quality of the data you get from CDOT, uh, CDOT would be uh, would be appreciated. Thank you for that question. Yes, there are um, errors with location of the points. A lot of times um, a point might be misplaced or have the wrong latitude longitude. So we noticed that. Um, we noticed some, some errors or I guess issues where maybe an officer doesn't fill out the full report. And so we're just missing information about the contributing factors or um, yeah, some other important pieces. It's because not all of it is required. Um, but I'd say for the most part, we probably spend about two months kind of cleaning, processing the data on our end. And I also will say um, my colleague Eric Broaden has been leading a crash data consortium, which is for the region to help kind of address these issues um, at all stages in the pipeline. 
And yeah, I, I suppose Eric could speak to that um, more in depth, but the, 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 up, the upswing of that is that the data is getting better. No, um, that, that's very helpful. And I would suggest that if you feel that you're not getting, or, or this information hasn't been shared with the appropriate people within CDOT, you know, there's several of us who are CDOT commissioners on the call. So I know that if you get the data to any one of us, we'll certainly make sure that it gets a little bit more attention with CDOT so that we're not, uh, that those those changes you identified seems to me like they would not be difficult for us to improve upon. So if you could share that, uh, if, if you don't feel like it's already being taken uh, to in the way that it should be, would appreciate it if you would get it to me or to one of the other CDOT commissioners that are active with Dr. Cog, and we'll make sure it gets to the right part. Yeah, Mr. Commissioner Adams. Chairman. Oh, go ahead, Jacob. You're probably going to say so, the same thing I'm about to. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want to make clear the, the particular data issues that Byron is pointing out are legitimate, but I want to emphasize it's not it, it's not CDOT data, actually. It's not the fault of, of folks at CDOT. It's not CDOT data inaccuracies. Crash data has a very sort of complicated um, uh, flow chart in the state in terms of how it gets processed. It goes to the Department of Revenue. It comes to CDOT. It comes to us. Both CDOT and Dr. Cog um, deal with the same issues that Byron pointed out. It's, it's sort of raw data that's coming to both agencies, and both agencies are working to clean the data. So I just want to make clear that while the issues that Byron said are, actually, are perfectly legitimate, it's not that it's because it's poor CDOT data. It's just raw data coming into both agencies that both agencies work to clean up. Thank you, Jacob. That's very helpful to understand. So we collectively have an opportunity to try and constantly <laughs> find an improvement. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I may, real quick, sure. just to add on to that. Jacob is exactly right. Jacobs, don't go away because uh, I, I want to make sure I'm getting this right with regards to the partnership that we have with CDOT and the cleansing of that data. Um, it's my understanding that we have responsibility for kind of geocoding the off network stuff is that right i see ron is nodding yeah um and cdoc kind of does the the on network on state system uh geocoding so um you know we clean that up a little bit but we really spend most of our time on the off system stuff that's correct we cdoc cdoc cleans the data and geolocates or geocodes the data for your on system facilities we do so for off-system facilities within the Dr. Cog region. We then put that, we then work with CDOT to put that data back together um, to create a, a unified data set, which we publish on our regional data catalog. So Eric, I actually want to make sure I've described that correctly in summary. Did I get it right? Uh, yes. Um, we do check the on-system when it's this, those, those high priority, the pest, um, non-motorist um, and motorcycle, in addition to the serious injury and fatal crashes. Um, but I don't think our system is necessarily re-geocoding many other of the off-system or on-system CDOT records. Um, and I also just want to reiterate, we do work pretty closely with um, the crash data team at CDOT. And when we get the data from them, we do a quality assurance and we ask questions, we send that back to them. We've been very responsive and working closely with them. And we do um, are, are able to provide coordinates back to CDOT, um, but it's kind of up to... CDOT if they're going to re change the attributes in their files to what we've changed it to. So there are a little bit of maybe a discrepancy there sometimes, but there is an option that we are providing this data back to CDOT after we get it from them. Uh, thanks to all of you. I, I appreciate those explanations. Thank you. Of course. All right, Jeff Kuhlman. Yeah, hey, Byron, I got a couple of technical questions regarding the data. You know, you were talking about how it identifies uh, the problem corridors or problem spots, is that based solely on the number of raw crashes or is it proportionalized some way to the traffic volumes on a particular corridor? And the reason I ask is, you know, if I was a commissioner of a rural county, an urban rural county, you might have an intersection out in the rural part that only has 10 crashes, but proportionally it's way out of whack to a more urban corridor with 60 crashes, for example. And my second question with the data is, and you kind of were going through your show, I didn't know when you had crash type, but when you're looking at an intersection, do you segregate the data by the various crash types that might happen at an intersection, a, an approach turn, a rear end, so forth? Great questions, and thank you. Yeah, um, I'll take the easy one first. The second one, yes, we do. So if you 
were to filter to data at an intersection, um, it will show you on the on one of the other tabs um, the breakdown of the road descriptions. So if it's an if it's you know right or the driver actions and the vehicle movements, so going straight, stopped in traffic, making left turn, um, those kinds of categories, and the crash types, rear end, broadside, side swipe. And so I think there's within that within those chart categories, there's also the approach turn, overtaking turn as well. So yes. Um, and then to your first question, the proportional one, we have been aware of the, the, the benefit of providing data in that format of the proportion to traffic volume. We weren't able to do that with this draft of the dashboard, so it just is showing frequency, locations of frequency. However, there's the, we do have a reference layer that you can turn on that is traffic modeled traffic volumes, so you can kind of get a sense of for different volumes where there are lots of crashes by just referencing that layer. So that's kind of our way of getting at that. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. Thank Jelly. you very much. You're muted. Chair Baker. Baker. Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, Shelly Cook has her hand raised. Yes, I called on her, I thought. Shelly? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you say that. Forgive me. Um, first of all, I just think it's a fabulous tool. Seems really powerful. Um, one of your bullet notes, Byron talked about um, assessing the efficacy of countermeasures. How how would a municipality, for example, go about doing that if they recently installed some in intersection improvement or protected bike lane, et cetera? Well, the the best way would be to use the date range filter. So if you had a facility installed at a certain time, you could filter to crashes before and after that that date. And then, however, the, the limitation, I suppose, of the dashboard is it's a five-year rolling window of crash data. And if you are installing that countermeasure this year, for example, we may not have 2024 data for a couple years, just kind of given the life cycle of the data. So Unfortunately, that's a limitation, but you could use the date range to look at kind of before and after um, as long as we have that covered in the years of the data. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Byron. Um, if you could put in the chat your contact information, that would be great. And then we'll we'll have other people call you or contact you if they have other questions. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number five. Dr. Cog, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Overview. This is a presentation. We've got Cole Nieder, who's Senior Transit Planner. Cole. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Well, it's showing up in slide sort of review, not presentation mode yet, but we can see it. It's like it is not letting me. So if this is okay, and if everybody can see that, I'm going to proceed, proceed for time's sake, if that's okay with everyone. I think that's a great idea. Great, right, awesome. All right. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's uh, senior transit planner, and I'm also a staff member that has been working on creating Dr. Cog's first uh, disadvantaged business enterprise program plan. Uh, we've presented brief uh, overviews of this uh, plan in the past, but we wanted to go into a bit more detail today on the plan's purpose and how we are implementing uh, DBE requirements into our existing procurement processes at the agency. Uh, so today I kind of wanted to go over some context around the plan's purpose and requirements, uh, different plan components, including how we calculate and achieve our base figure for DBE participation, and also the steps we take to monitor, uh, track, and report on DBE participation within the agency. So at a high level, the purpose of a DBE program plan is to outline policies that ensure businesses owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals can compete for federal contracts that are provided by Dr. Cog. Uh, when an agency anticipates that they will be issuing contracts to recipients and subrecipients greater than in total than $250,000, oh. 
uh, as Dr. Cog anticipates through uh, our Section 5310 Enhanced Mobility of Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities Program. Uh, we must have a DBE program plan in place as a federal requirement. Uh, we have fully developed this plan because we are uh, Section 5310, uh, because of our Section 5310 funding requirements, uh, but we anticipate using these policies and strategies outlined in this plan across the agency um, just beyond those contracts alone to increase our DBE uh, participation um, beyond just the Section 5310 uh, funding. So keep that component in mind as we go over some additional plan components and requirements as well. Hey, Cole, this yes. is Ron. I don't see your slides advancing. My apologies here. I can just do it manually. Is that working? Yes, it seems to be. We're on slide number two, I believe. Okay. Go straight to three here. Three. Yep, you're on three now. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the basic components of a DBE program plan, uh, they include uh, guidance outlining actions taken on uh, essentially four topics. So this includes uh, first setting uh, the agency's goals for DBE firm participation in contracting opportunities, including uh, the process to of which how uh, Dr. Cog uh, reaches their contracting goal. Uh, the second would be existing and also recommended uh, steps that Dr. Cog can take to elevate uh, DBE firm participation and also meet our established participation goals. Uh, third would be guidance on how Dr. Cog can conduct different outreach and engagement initiatives. Uh, this would ensure uh, DBE firms are aware of Dr. Cog's program plan. And then lastly, uh, uh, the federal reporting and monitoring requirements Dr. Cog needs uh, to adhere to when reporting uh, and monitoring uh, DBE participation. So what I want to unpack in a little bit more detail today is primarily on how Dr. Cog sets our agency's contracting goals, uh, as well as how we intend to meet those goals then through uh, a couple of modifications to our uh, procurement procedures, and then also outreach and improved communications. So I'm gonna start with how we calculate our overall DBE goal and to um, calculate our overall participation goal. The agency follows the process that is aligned with the FTA's guidelines. Um, this develops a base figure of participation for DBE firms, uh, otherwise reflected as the percentage of dollars that we expect to spend on DBE firms within a given year. And this process includes identifying a relevant market area, including this would uh, essentially be our uh, geographical region, uh, and determining work categories that are relevant to the contracts that we commonly offer through our Section 5310 funding opportunities. Um, determining work categories, uh, we included identifying uh, NAICS classification codes uh, that are aligned with the project activities that are generally related to our contracts. Uh, we then determined the number of DBE firms that are then ready, uh, willing, and able to perform the types of work uh, needed for the projects. And we use CDOT's uh, Unified Certification Program for this and uh, their um, DBE directory, uh, which lists out the available DBE firms and their locations within uh, our geographical area. And then to develop that final base figure, uh, we then compare the number of relevant DBE firms that we've found in our area against the total number of firms, and this is regardless of their DBE status. Um, this calculates our overall goal for participation that you can see here. Um, we can make adjustments to this goal. After following this process, uh, we can do additional market analysis uh, and uh, comparing our goal to other uh, similar agencies in our area. Uh, for example, for this specific plan, we did compare this to uh, North Front Ranges, MPO, and uh, Transport. Um, given that our goals were pretty close in percentage to their plans, um, and that this was our first DBE plan, we did not have a lot of background data to go off of for our own existing DBE participation. We chose not to make any adjustments to this goal um, for this iteration of this plan that can change going forward. And again, I want you, uh, everyone to keep in mind that this goal of 1.8%, uh, it's only for our uh, Section 5310 uh, funding program. So we have to follow the federal requirements to calculate that specific goal. Um, but we do want to see a general increase in DBE participation in contracts beyond only our 5310 funding. 
So what steps can we take then to achieve our participation goals? Uh, we can take external steps. Uh, that would include better collaboration uh, with CDOT to distribute their DBE directory and collaborate more on, on how they do that and, and uh, learn more. Uh, we can also provide DBE firms information about our own bidding processes and how we uh, and how to submit proposals for our contracts. Uh, we can also provide technical assistance opportunities uh, that could be through workshops and different training sessions uh, that inform uh, different DBE firms about upcoming project opportunities and our different or unique contract requirements that they should be aware of. Um, these possible opportunities are all topics we are going to continue to evaluate as we implement uh, this program plan, uh, starting with more facilitated collaboration between our own internal departments um, and also externally as we uh, reach out to CDOT. Internally, uh, we have already made some modifications to our own procurement processes. Um, that helps us better track and also monitor DBE participation across our own agency. And the best example of this is a new DBE program information request form. You can see here um, that applicants must fill out as part of our procurement process. And this essentially provides us with more information on DBE firms that are applying or involved in an application. Um, it also um, highlights their applicable NAI CS codes uh, related to their work so we can track that a little bit better and also some important uh, business contact information as well. Um, as we report uh, DBE participation to the FTA, uh, this tracking activity um, for all contracts will assist us in meeting those different reporting requirements uh, levied by the FTA as well as setting a bit more accurate uh, DBE firm participation goal as we continue to update this plan going forward. So as we review and score contracts and decide who we want to award contracts to, uh, DBE subcontractor participation is also now scored as part of the process for RFP submissions. Um, this gives additional scoring consideration to submissions that include a DBE subcontractor as part of their proposal. Um, we view this as both um, somewhat of a, as an incentive for uh, firms to include DBE firm participation within their uh, original proposals. It also provides uh, better review considerations while we are deciding on who to award contracts to. Um, this review criteria is now included in all scoring processes for any RFP submissions, regardless of the uh, funding source. It does not just have to be 5310 funding. So as to next steps for uh, Dr. Cog and as an agency as a whole, we anticipate updating this program plan on a consistent basis, both adhering to the uh, federal requirements for plan updates. Um, and then we also are able to update this on an as needed basis. Um, that can come as we gain a bit more insight into uh, DBE participation levels uh, through our modifications to our existing RFP process. Um, when, while we do this and while we implement components of that, we can better evaluate um, base figure adjustments to our existing goal uh, calculation. Um, we can also locate and collect uh, or conduct market analysis within the Dr. Cog area to give a bit more uh, detailed idea of what firms are available uh, in our region. And finally, we plan on assessing what technical assistance, uh, outreach and training sessions uh, would be best suited to increase DBE participation for our specific contracts and how we can go about uh, creating a roadmap to implement uh, components of those as well. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Apologize for the screen sharing difficulties. No problem. All right, uh, are there any questions for Cole? <clears throat> I see one hand, uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yes. Um, my question, if you can hear me all right, um, my question is whether or not the DBE list that Dr. Cog will have will be in addition to or merely incorporate CDOT's list. The list that we utilize is the state's list. It's CDOT's list. Um, so we always adhere to um, what they are putting forth and uh, mirror that. And my next question may be, thank you very much. My next question may be uh, more directed to other staff. And if it's out of scope, please um, let me know. Would this 
with the utilization of a DBE in a plan proposal or a project by a sponsor in a Dr. Cog MPO project, like a tip or set aside, would that be part of the scoring criteria to um, enhance a project or um, score it in any other way? I know that we uh, have implemented this into our contract review processes. Um, I will defer to uh, Ron as I see he's unmuted. Yeah, so I, thank you, Director Moby. Um, Chair, Mr. Chair, I, I, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, uh, Director Moby, the DBE requirement only applies to Dr. Cog's use of funds for Dr. Cog sponsored projects. It does not extend to, for instance, a local agency that receives federal funds through our transportation improvement program and then proceeds with the project. Does that answer your question? Thank correct? You. Yes, and I, I think I gave a two-part question because my, my question is as well, whether um, it's worthwhile for a project sponsor to offer that there is a CEDA DBE involved in a particular project as something that might be considered in the scoring process we've we've not incorporated that or anticipated at this point incorporating that into the tip scoring criteria if that's your question and i think the one one if just off the top of my head i think one challenge of that might be that when typically when uh project sponsors uh, come forward with a project application for competitive tip funds that the sponsoring agency doesn't know who the contractor is going to be. Um, so incorporating sort of that consideration into the review and, and um, uh, an award process might be a challenge. You've read my mind. Thank you. That, that's kind of where I was um, going to think about next. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Other questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Cole, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. And again, if you could put your contact information into chat, if anyone does have any questions they want to uh, ask you later, then uh, they can contact you directly. With that, we'll move on to our next discussion item. This is public engagement plan update. And we've got Kelsey Fofar jones uh, public engagement planner. Kelsey? Uh, yes, and um, Carolyn is going to help me uh, with the presentation. Perfect. Great. Everyone can see that okay? Yes, I, I can. Okay. okay. And can everyone hear me okay? It's telling me that the voice quality is poor. Just a little soft, maybe a little bit more oomph too. <laughs> okay, I'll try and project a little bit more. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Forfar-Jones. I'm the public engagement planner, um, and I am leading the update to the public engagement plan. Uh, we're currently um, in the um, in the document. Um, we're currently um, in the middle of the process. So um, this is just an update um, for you all on where we're at um, in the update to the plan. Um, so just wanted to start off with um, a little bit of um, background information on what the public engagement plan is. Um, for members of the public, uh, this plan is a useful way to understand Dr. Cog's planning process. Um, for any advocates in the community, this plan can help them figure out the best place to get involved. Um, so. The plan includes um, Dr. Cox's public engagement philosophy. Uh, if any residents are curious about how often we do engagement, this plan really goes over the when, where, why, and how Dr. Cog does engagement. Um, it also um, it also includes the best ways to get involved. Um, if a resident or organization would like Dr. Cog to consider their opinion. Uh, this plan provides them with that guidance. Um, 
and they can find resources on meetings, future plan updates, and understand uh, how they might best get involved. And then finally, um, Dr. Cog's policy process. Um, so the way policy moves from TAC to RTC to board uh, might be a given for um, any of us, but it's not necessarily for the public. Uh, and so the public engagement plan outlines these basic steps um, so that anyone unfamiliar with the process can understand what we do at these committee meetings. Um, the public engagement plan is, is also a reference for staff. Um, and um, for example, uh, the, the plan goes through Dr. Cog's guiding principles for public engagement. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the principles um, in further detail uh, on the next slide. Um, but these principles were agreed upon by staff. Um, and then the plan walks through how Dr. Cog's staff can embrace these principles. Um, some plans also have required public comment periods, uh, a required public notice or other requirements, and this plan sets staff on the right path when they need to make sure they are, they're following the correct legal processes. And then this is most heavy in the appendices, um, but a large portion of the plan is just a lot, is long lists of ideas Public, public engagement strategies, um, potential partners, um, and those sorts of things. And um, these lists can be helpful for staff who, who don't know where to start with engagement as a brainstorming tool. Um, and then they can also help staff evaluate their current public engagement work um, to improve for the future. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the foundation of the public engagement plan is Dr. Cog's engagement principles. Um, and those principles are early engagement, um, ensuring that we are including um, the community early in the process, um, ongoing engagement, ensuring that, the, that um, we're engaging with the public throughout the entire process. Timely and adequate notice, um, making sure that we are um, letting the public know um, at an appropriate time that we're um, asking for feedback. Uh, consistent access to information, so they always have um, access to um, our documents and any necessary information um, they might need to engage appropriately. public review and comment on plans. Um, and so these this is um, some of those required processes, but ensuring that they get to see the, um, the full um, document and get to, um, to um, give us any comments on, um, on those plans. Um, consideration of perspectives, perspectives from disadvantaged communities, ensuring that we're hearing from um, everyone uh, in, in the Dr. Cog area um, and that we're, um, we're finding those um, traditionally less heard voices and making sure that they're in the room as well. And then finally, regular review of the public engagement process. Um, and this is something that we're um, even doing right now just with um, updating our public engagement plan. So why are we updating the public engagement plan? Um, the last update was in 2019, and a lot has changed since then. Um, not only just um, not only in you know our region, but um, in the way that we lead engagement and the practices we use. Uh, it's also within the UPWP to update the plan this year. So following that. And then finally, uh, we strive to make Dr. Cog's engagement with the public um, as best we can, and um, we're always looking to expand our reach. So um, what's actually changing <laughs> in the plan? Um, we're editing the document in several ways, and um, some of those changes, some of the simple changes 
are new information on virtual engagement strategies, uh, piloted innovative public engagement strategies, techniques and requirements for regional planners and AAA staff, revisions to make the document, document more readable and usable. Um, and so let's just um, start with the first one. Uh, the plan's major update was in 2019, or last major update was in 2019, before the COVID pandemic. And since then, Dr. Cog's staff has embraced many strategies of virtual public engagement. Um, and these include virtual public meeting options and then um, our social pinpoint site, um, which is a, a landing page for all of Dr. Cog's projects with public engagement and public facing information. And if um, any of you on this call haven't um, played around on our social pinpoint site, I um, suggest you do. We've got all of our projects on there. Um, the sub area planning team has piloted several engagement strategies that are new to Dr. Cog, uh, and we will be including information on, on those in the plan as well. Um, and some of those innovative public engagement strategies include um, compensation for focus groups, food at public meetings, transit passes for attendees, um, contract and contracting with community-based organizations, um, and, and our translation policy. Um, uh, this plan update will include some lessons learned from, from those pilots. The existing plan um, goes into detail on the techniques and requirements typical for transportation planning, but uh, Dr. Cog does more than just transportation planning. And so we're working with uh, our RPD and AAA staff to incorporate content for their work as well. Uh, both RPD and AAA have many types of plans and processes, um, and some of these have required engagement practices, um, and these requirements can change, but um, at the very least, we can we can take note of which plans have those requ requirements. Um, and then um, also hoping to have this have this plan um, document um, what engagement practices um, both RPD and AAA staff are using. Um, and um, and that they can um, and and hopefully it can be um, a, a tool for future engagement. Um, and finally, we will be including revisions uh, to make the document more readable. These include edits that make accessibility remediation easier, um, as well as edits that make it easier for staff to read and use. So those are, that's a lot of stuff that <laughs> we're working on. Um, and so to show how we're getting it done, um, we just have a brief um, or a, an overview schedule or timeline for you all. Um, and so we're currently in the document development stage. Uh, we anticipate that will be done by mid-November um, and hoping to um, have the entire plan done by March um, and have that uh, ready to be adopted by our board and committees. So um, next steps, we've conducted workshops with key staff members um, and we need to make sure, we're, now we're in the process of incorporating their feedback into the plan. Um, we're also uh, having um, some, conducting some meetings with um, some of our regional partners and asking them um, what they're doing in engagement and ensuring that um, we're um, up to date and um, doing the best that we can uh, with engagement. Um, and so once we're done with the, um, with document development, then we'll give staff a chance to review the draft document. Um, and then we will have our 45 day uh, public comment period. Um, and then, um, yeah, then you guys will get to see the, the final product. 
And so that's all for me. I don't know if there are any um, questions. Questions, raise your hand or just chime in. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Kelsey. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to our administrative items. This is our time that we ask our members to um, comment or discuss what's going on in their world. First up, Colorado Department of Transportation report. And let me make sure I've got my participants up. Oh, there it is, sorry. I'm not seeing any, okay. CDOT, who is here from CDOT that would like to? Commissioner Adams, are you commenting for CDOT today? I, I, I'll do something really briefly, and okay. then I'll defer to my other commissioners who are on the line. Uh, we are scheduled. Uh, we have our normal monthly meeting scheduled for uh, uh, Wednesday, our uh, what we call our workshop. Uh, and then on Thursday, we'll have our normal uh, CDOT uh, commission meeting. And this meeting... Uh, largely is a meeting where we'll discuss uh, the budget. We have a, a couple of items on the budget supplement for 2025. We uh, will start the discussion around the 2026 proposed budget. Uh, we're going to spend a little time on the fuel impact uh, enterprise. Uh, we'll get a program update, and then uh, we'll talk about the 2026 budget. And then we'll spend some time on the 10-year plan for the bridge and enterprise uh, uh, fund. And probably one that you know may or may not be of some interest to some members, but we, you know, I guess uh, I'd like to just speak. Uh, Vince Rogalski has been the chairman of Stack for a long, long time. And Vince has stepped down as the chairman of Stack. And uh, Gary Beatty, who some of you may know and recall from Gary's days as the uh, CDOT chair and, uh, and vice chair and a member of the commission has now replaced uh, Vince as the as the lead and of the uh, of stack. Uh, that's about all I will comment. I, I will defer to my other CDOT colleagues for their comments. Uh, Darius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will probably allow the commissioners to go first. Um, Karen Stewart and uh, okay. Commissioner Stewart Sorry. and Commissioner Cook. All right, Commissioner Stewart. Well, thank you. I won't turn everything, but I think that uh, our other two commissioners would be interested in speaking. But I did want to say last month was pretty interesting for a number of us. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time at the Transportation Commission um, allocating funds, um, either looking at what the costs of things are, what projects are needed, um, what the progress is on projects. And uh, last month we did a road trip and we started in Denver and took the busting across to um, Grand Junction. And we stopped in some pretty interesting places along the way. Uh, we looked at um, the, uh, the uh, Floyd Hill project, uh, extraordinary project. Others might want, want to talk about that. Um, the magnitude of what's going on there, if you've driven that, you'll know it's a significant project, a very high dollar project and we're making good progress. It does interrupt traffic a lot, and I know motorists are frustrated with it, um, but but once it's finished, it's going to be a much safer drive and a much more efficient drive, and we stopped there. We stopped at the um, Genesee Wildlife um, Underpass to see that project. That was a new one. We stopped at Vail Pass. That's been um, a project for the rest area there. Uh, if you know uh, the, if you've driven that, you know that the Vail Pass has been closed for a very long time now, uh, the Vail Pass rest area, and it's a project that's being done in uh, collaboration with the Forest Service. Quite impressive, and should open hopefully the first of next year. And uh, we went on from there, and 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 I'll I'll finish up with this portion. I did want to say another thing that happened last month that was extraordinarily important to us, I think, is um, 
we have been working for the last, I would say, four or five years to put in employee housing where it's um, where there's an opportunity. And the reason we have wanted to do that is because it's very hard to get first responders or maintainers or essential personnel to work on I-70 or 285 um, areas like that that are um, difficult to get to when um, there are storm related problems or accident related problems. And it's because the cost of living is so high and there's very little affordable housing available and CDOT's taken it on um, as a mission to provide uh, subsidized housing, reduced cost housing for, um, for our employees that need to be on site. Uh, so Fair Play is the first one that opened. It opened last month. We did a ribbon cutting, 12 um, two-story homes built um, on an area that belonged to CDOT that was a maintenance yard in the center of town adjacent to a school. We did a collaborative effort with um, Colorado State Patrol, CDOT, uh, the town of um, Fair Play, and the education um, Board of Education there. These 12 two-story homes are two and three bedroom. They're pet friendly, they're kid friendly, um, and they'll be available for um, CSP personnel, CDOT essential workers, um, and even uh, people who work for the town of Fair Play and um, for the uh, teachers that, that are right across the street um, in Fair Play at the elementary school. And John Lorme, uh, who is um, in charge of our asset protection, asset management piece at CDOT, he says his uh, hope is that someone from CDOT will be married to someone from uh, the school and they can have a house together. And someone from CSP might be married to someone who's a, you know, a critical incident responder, <laughs> ambulance or EMT. And uh, he envisions um, an extraordinary opportunity for people. And also for us at CDOT, you know, in the past, we've had to get people out of Denver or out of uh, Grand Junction, makes it very difficult to respond in a timely fashion. And many times we've had to put people up in hotels for extended period of times. And so this is a really win-win. My understanding, it's the first in the nation for state transportation um, department to do this sort of thing. So um, I was happy to be there, happy to be there for the ribbon cutting. And the uh, next one we have coming up is in Frisco, and that should be the first of the year. Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, either Commissioner Algin or Commissioner Cook. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Commissioner Algin. Um, yeah, I guess not a whole lot to add. Um, well, I guess I'll also share that we're also um, going to be doing a, a fall legislative update. Um, I think it was last year where when the commissioners asked CDOT to be more involved in the legislative agenda process. And so those conversations, uh, we started those earlier and we're continuing those. So uh, we'll also have a mobility systems committee uh, update tomorrow where we'll have um, the mountain rail update. So uh, full as always, <laughs> third week of the month is always full. And um, I'll yield to Commissioner Cook. Nothing to add, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Papas. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. The only thing I would add is uh, the department is currently engaging with our local partners, our the regional TPRs as part of the uh, development of the regional plans and the statewide transportation plan, which we expect out in August of 2025. Um, continued discussions as we get closer to that with engagement with Dr. Cog will take place as well. Dr. Cog, as you know, already has their regional transportation plan already developed, um, but that is a key component within the statewide transportation plan and the next 10 year plan. And that's all I have for today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Darius. All right, RTD, um, Director Guzman. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I typed in my comment in the notes really fast, but I didn't want to forget where I was at on my web page. Um, if you go to rtd-denver.com backslash service alerts, 
there is planned service disruptions on the E and the D line, or sorry, the E and the R lines. Um, it'll significantly impact service, but we are providing shuttles on the E line, um, and that will be from October 15th through 17th. So timely to get that information out because it starts today. Um, they need to replace some wires is my understanding. And so they're gonna shut down that section to be able to do that work. Also, uh, the link will take you directly to the service changes for January, exciting stuff. We get to expand some service, um, create some new lines to connect the Denver Theater District through the Rhino Arts District on the east side of town, um, but they are looking for feedback. And I put that out particularly to um, ask everybody to give your opinions about some of those routes because those changes come up quickly. Um, they're put before the board, we make a decision, they go into effect, but now is the time to talk about them in October so that by January when we're making that decision, we have full feedback from everybody. Uh, other than that, we're going into budget season, so the draft budget is available for all to look at at RTD's website and at the office um, that is going through the finance process, uh, finance committee, and to the board, and uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Director Siroy or Director Busick? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Busick here, uh, nothing really further to add uh, other than to say, you know, our rail replacement, rail inspection replacement, all those things we've been doing uh, that really unfortunately impact um, service are, are, are moving along quickly and uh, we're making great progress on that. And of course, safety is always our concern. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Sarai. Yeah, and just uh, one thing to add um, that um, those of you that will be walking down the mall will finally be seeing shuttles running between um, Curtis and kind of towards all the way to Union Station. So those, um, I think, officially started running on Sunday um, in full service. So you'll see those and you can take advantage of those. Thank you. That is uh, really good news. I'm, I'm happy to hear about that because I do get questions about that. Um, any other RTD comments? I didn't see any. Um, for RAC, um, we're going to have uh, Mike Silverstein. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you. Um, a few updates. Uh, we have completed another summertime ozone season, and just a, a data point for everybody's information, we had, oh, we had over 40 days of non-compliant ozone values uh, throughout the Denver Metro Front Range region. So that, that's about a third of the days above the, um, the ozone standards. So it tells you the, uh, it gives you an indication of the scope of our problem and uh, the challenges of, uh, of uh, reducing our, our emissions in our region to uh, compliant levels to meet ozone standards over the next few years. So lots of work ahead of us which leads to uh, our work plan. Our work plan and budget are, are under development as, as everyone has uh, indicated here in the report outs. Um, and uh, our work plan basically has, um, has our office developing with our, with our agency partners and all of our stakeholders, our, our next air quality plan, which um, requires that we come into compliance by 2027. So that's just two summer seasons away of um of measuring compliant level ozone values which is a real challenge um and on top of that we have the the wildfire influence which which just adds to the problem it doesn't cause our problem it just adds to the degree of violation so we just have a lot of work ahead of us looking at um on on emission reduction strategies that um, range from um the you know further uh, regulation on on industrial facilities, uh, consumer products, those um, those things we use in our in our homes, such as paints and solvents, um, personal care products, um, industrial solvents, and and uh, surface coatings, um, cleaning products, etc. There are there are cleaner, lower emitting um, products available, and um, whether Colorado chooses to mandate the use in our in our region, that will be a up for decision. Uh, uh, a topic area you're, you're going to hear more about that's called indirect sources. These are large um, facilities or activities that attract or generate vehicle trips. 
how do we reduce the impact of the things we all do, um, whether we're going to um, a large event in our vehicles or um, warehousing operations with their uh, product distribution, whether they're receiving or delivering products, and how how do we gain emission reductions through um, you know th you know from activities such as those, and there's many other. Um, what we call indirect sources out there. So it's really transportation activities and what do we do to make an impact and re either cap emissions or or reduce emissions over time. And then um, to help us with all of that is RAC is preparing um, applications to the EPA for significant monies to help with our lawn and garden um, equipment electrification efforts. Uh, lawn and garden equipment is a significant contributor to our summertime ozone, and um, electrifying that equipment is a is a dramatic uh, solution. And uh, it takes money to do uh, to do that to provide incentives for um, uh, governments, um, private contractors, and um, individuals to to go electric and to um, to make rapid change in that sector. So hopefully we'll be. Um, uh, receiving uh, will be awarded monies if we have a successful grant, excuse me, grant application later um, this winter. Also applying to um, the Colorado Non-Attainment Area Enterprise that is managed through um, CDOT. And um, they've opened up um, applications for significant monies to, for um, air pollution reduction programs. And so we hope over the next uh, six months that uh, we'll receive good news that um, that uh, many of our ongoing efforts can be can be expanded with significant new monies uh, from that source. So uh, a lot going on at the rack to uh, to make a difference in these um, in these crummy ozone um, numbers that we that we continue to have, and uh, we just appreciate everybody's um, support for for our work. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I did want to point out to everyone that there's a doodle poll out there for um, this meeting, uh, looking at if we want to change in 2025. Um, I think, Cam, you're planning on having both the November meeting and the December meeting, and then maybe making a change in January. Was that where you uh, were headed to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's for the, uh, the pre-RTC meeting. Uh, and that was just for the um, the Dr. Cog members and alternates. Got it. Thanks. Sorry about that. All good. All right. Direct Executive Director Rex, do you have anything to add? I do not, sir. Thank you. All right. We might be giving people back a little bit of time in their day. Our next meeting will be November 19th. Is there anything else for the good of the group? Anyone else have any comments or questions? Vote, vote, vote. Definitely, definitely. I would also point out that Eric has put in the chat um, the contact information for Alyssa Heron um, at CDOT um, on any questions that you may have about data and the process. So that is also in the chat if you'd like to have her contact information. Uh, I agree with, with Director Guzman. We, this is important. Uh, we've got an election upcoming, and uh, it's so important that everyone get out there and exercise their their right to vote. If there's nothing else, uh, we're going to go ahead and adjourn. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Great job, Chairman. <laughs>